Hi guys, I'm so glad you're all joining with us today, today's webinar, the second day of the summer camp um, in partner with Navitas. I'm Shahid from Education Basket and I was, as I was telling you guys earlier, uh, Education Basket is an education consultant agency located in Egypt, Qatar, Kuwait and Lebanon. And we are partnering with Navitas for the summer boot camp in order for professors to come and have a love an interactive uh, conversation with you guys to tell you guys more um, about universities. Um, and today's lecture is going to be about mentorship. So mentorship is basically being guided by a mentor, especially from someone who is experienced. We can say it's uh, when you're looking up to someone and having someone always um, being like a leader somehow, but Dr. Sam will explain that in a better way. So Dr. Sam is a professor at SFU and FIC, and he appreciates the opportunity to share his experiences with his students. And um, his goal is to let the students understand who they are and not necessarily what they're going to do. So Dr. Sam holds a master's degree in leadership from the University of Exeter in England, and he has a higher education certificate from Harvard University. So he's a speaker and a storyteller, and this is what he's going to do today, that he's going to talk to us about mentorship. So the floor is with you, Dr. Sam. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. And I'm just gonna get my screen up here and hopefully everyone can see this, but no, thank you for the opportunity. And what I will do is the importance of mentorship. And I also want to talk about this aspect of personal branding as well, because personal branding blends in with mentorship as well. Also, what I'm going to do is provide you some tips and ideas, whether it's Simon Fraser University and Fraser International College, or wherever you study, how do you make the most of your learning experiences there? I do want to say, and I hope I say it correctly, Marhaba from Vancouver, and it's a real pleasure to be able to share a lot today and to share with you in the short time, about 45 minutes, all of these aspects and details. <clears throat> I'm going to share with you a little bit about me, about FIC and SFU, uh, personal, the importance of personal branding, mentorship, storytelling, and then some life lessons that I think will be helpful. But first, a little bit about who I am. Like, who is this person before you? So I'm a speaker and a storyteller. In other words, the stories that I've been able to capture, I share with my students and I share in any of these areas where I'm asked to speak. <clears throat> I'm a mentor and a coach, and I'll talk a little bit about mentorship and coaching later on. <clears throat> but mentorship is... Uh, as mentioned, I do about three to eight mentorship conversations per week. Over the years, it's been about 5,000 conversations to help people in life and career. I'm an author and a blogger, so been able to do, activate my writing. I'm an applied academic, meaning it's not just about research, and I don't do research, but what I do is I share theories, and I always talk about myth, theory, and practice. Myth is what we believe the world to be. Theory is a logical explanation. And practice is, does it work in industry? I'm an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. <clears throat> As an entrepreneur, I've built out businesses for myself, but I've helped a number of different startups. But I'm also an intrapreneur, meaning an organization that is very structured, has given me freedom to build within the confines of that organization and they've given me a good budget and and allowed me to risk i'm also a problem solver so we live in a world where there's a lot of problems and that's where a situation emerges people can tell me what the problem is but very few people will try to solve the problem so i try to solve the problems and i'm a community do-gooder in other words what i do is i work with about 45 different nonprofits over the years to help them become more entrepreneurial. All of this makes me who I am. And again, the, the mentor that I've become to help organizations and people. But one thing about mentorship and coaching, 
because of all of these experiences, people come to me looking for the answers to life. I am not this monk sitting on top of a mountain with an orange saffron robe and a beard. And you come to me and I, and I, I basically say, you will do this. What my role and responsibility is to ask questions. I'm a difficult monk because the monk that you seek, the answers that you seek are within you. My job is to get the answers out. Now, this is just an example of the places I have been numerous times that I've been able to visit these places. Unfortunately, Lebanon and Saudi Arabia, not yet. Uh, so I'm hopeful to when things and the pandemic uh, ease up that I'll be able to visit the region again. I've built a uh, tremendous relationships in the area with and have many friends there now and always it's when are you coming back uh, so i look forward to it um, you know all of these places and regions uh, these are all the pictures i've taken while i've been in many of these places so i have always enjoyed my time in those regions so i want to share with you a little bit about simon fraser university and fic and how this is a really great journey the, the things that I want to share with you is helping you with regards to your advancing in education, but preparation is always going to be the key. And by you being here, you're already demonstrating this preparation piece. I always say that, you know, you're on one side of the bridge on the left side. You have your education, like FIC, SFU in the center. That's the, that's the piece that's going to connect you to your future. Now, so just to give you a little bit of background, uh, uh, Simon Fraser University and Fraser International College as part of SFU sits in Vancouver, Canada. Oftentimes people think, or they've asked me, so, you know, do we have snow throughout the entire year? Actually in Vancouver, we rarely get snow. Uh, we are the mildest temperature in all of Canada. But Simon Fraser University is Canada's top comprehensive university, according to the Maclean's ranking. And out of the past 12 out of 13 years, we've been ranked as the number one comprehensive university. FIC is part of this community and part of SFU. So why Simon Fraser University or Fraser International College? Because I teach at both FIC and SFU. What I really like about this model, and I've been teaching at FIC since 2009, is if you're an international student and you come directly to a post-secondary institution, you're gonna be dropped in to a class of anywhere from 150 to five, 600 students. FIC is at the SFU campus and it allows the international students to have a much smaller classroom 30 students, 35. My current class is 32 students. And the course that I teach at FIC is the same course that's taught at SFU. But instead of having a large classroom, it's a small piece. The first year, you're going to be at FIC, and then you're going to transition to SFU. So you're at the SFU campus, and you get orientated to the university while you're there. You get access to the library, the gymnasium, clubs and uh, activities, but also all of the amenities that are up at SFU. But the benefit is these smaller classes because I really build relationships with the students to help them even after they have finished FIC, I'm still connected with a lot of my students that have gone to SFU and then graduated as well. It's a really great stepping stone and transition program. And we have had to go online and this is changing back to going in person in the fall, all our classes or majority of the classes are still going to are now going to go back to being in person with maybe a quarter of the classes accessible online. So we've been fully online and now we're going back to the classroom, but there will be some classes that may still be available online as well. 
So at FIC, the courses that uh, we offer in business is Biz 200, and that's the course I teach. It's a fundamental introduction to business essentials. We cover all different topics from things like understanding the Canadian economy, uh, ethics, um, entrepreneurship, uh, operations, management, uh, accounting, leadership, uh, marketing. So a number of different areas that just gives you a sampling of it. But we also have introduction to essentials of business communication. So establishing your confidence in your writing and speaking abilities. And then the introduction to financial accounting. But also what we have are these very cool electives that you could do, but you build that first foundational year at the SFU campus at FIC and then transfer. So here's eight tips to successfully transition. You have to, regardless of where you go, prioritize your time. It's very easy to slip with regards to homework or assignments, but if you prioritize your time, it's going to be beneficial. Learn how to study. It's different than high school. And there are different tools and there are different uh, areas that are going to support your education. Organize yourself. So you prioritize your time, but also organize it and use your calendar accordingly. It's also about managing stress. The first semester is always the most challenging because it's a whole new environment, not just academically, but just socially as well and being in a new country. So managing the stress is also very important for you as well. It's also important to stress that a low mark is not the end of the world. Uh, oftentimes your first semester, because you may be overwhelmed, it may be a bit more challenging. But if you get that low mark, I'm not saying, you know, oh yeah, everything is fine, but equally it's not the end of the world. Doesn't mean you have to drop out. All it means is let's examine what is it that you need to change and to support your further growth and development? Also, take your time choosing courses. Oh, and what I'll do is at the end of it, I'll uh, do Q&A. Uh, so don't worry, I'll take your questions at the end. Uh, take your time choosing the courses. Uh, be strategic and think, okay, what are the things I think I might be interested in? And what are some of the required things I need to do? Understand that help will always be available to you, whether through your uh, lectures, uh, lecturers like me or administration staff, but help is always available as well. But enjoy the experience of going to post-secondary. It's a, it's a life altering area. In my class, we do things like exams, obviously. I make my students do group presentations solving a business case in a group presentation setting. Uh, the one that I've given them this semester is on H&M and fast fashion. How are we going to resolve this fast fashion issue with H&M? They also do an individual presentation just to give them a, an opportunity to, um, you know, try their hand at presenting. But again, it's a very simple presentation that talks about who they are. I give them micro assignments. Give me your opinion about this and in a couple of paragraphs. We have discussions and I do office hours. So it's a chance for you to meet your instructor as well, one-on-one. -on -one. Now, there are also different programs you can do in the university and FIC and SFU have uh, these opportunities. Co-op is available at SFU and co-op is where you get real life work experience, clubs, uh, these are uh, clubs that you could join for social interactions. You can go on an international exchange. While you're studying at uh, the university, you're able to go on to another country, get credit for the courses, and build on your experiences and make it more of a global degree. And sports. I mean, we have varsity and intramural sports, so you, again, can uh, get involved and engaged. But co-op is really cool because it's an opportunity to test drive a job and career because you get paid for your work. You're going to make these connections with industries. And we have different co-ops in so many places like in business, in computing science, in communications, uh, 
you know, criminology, you name it, there are co-op opportunities. And it's one of the best, uh, SFU has one of the best in all of Canada. Now I'm gonna slide into this mentorship and personal branding. The idea is, what is a brand? I mean, we see a brand as in Coca-Cola. It's very established, like pretty much around the world, as soon as you see this, you know exactly what it is. Now, do you have a brand? So tell me, go to chat and just drop me a note to say, do you have a personal brand? What's your thoughts? Do you have a personal brand? What's your thoughts? Okay. Well, I'll share with you. If you're not sure or say no, you have a brand. A brand is basically if I take you out of the room and your friends are in there or family members, what are they going to say about you? That's what we call a brand. And you have to guard and protect it. You have to have the, the most dedicated effort towards your own personal brand. And personal identity, I mean, I will share with you that I struggled with this because when I graduated from university many, many years ago, I graduated with business and political science and, you know, had a really great uh, experience there. But just the fact that business and political science, what a great combination. But the problem was I was so focused on what I wanted to do, I never really understood who I was. So that personal identity piece was missing. And if you want to be, you know, get into, let's say, mentorship, uh, being mentored uh, by an individual, understanding who you are is definitely going to help you tremendously. I always say, and I've, I did a TEDx, I've done two TEDx speeches. One of them was on how do you activate the voice within to be louder than the noise around you? So, it's who, not what. Many times we are so focused on what you're going to do when really what we need to focus on is who are you? Because by knowing who you are, you're then able to move forward. So when we look at this personal branding piece, think of it this way. It's a beautiful sunny day. You need to go buy a pair of flip-flops. Well, there's a corner store. And the corner store basically sells food, lottery tickets, coffee, uh, Slurpees, <clears throat> hardware, fried chicken. And then you have Starbucks. Would we go to Starbucks to buy a pair of flip-flops? And obviously the answer for Starbucks is no, because we know that they're tea, coffee, food related items. The corner store may have it. So, what you really want to do is start pulling your brand and who you are as an individual to become sort of like that Starbucks brand. Now, people may argue, but isn't it better to be the grocery store, the corner store, because you offer everything to everybody? Well, that's fine, except people aren't necessarily going to find you because you have such a wide array. The people will gravitate towards the people who already have that personal brand. So a lot of what I do for a living, I don't uh, actively seek out opportunities. The opportunities come to me because of who I am and what I have been able to establish. I've got this very short video that I'm gonna share with you. It's only three minutes long and hopefully you can access it here, but I'm gonna share this with you. And it really does cover this aspect of personal branding. You are not defined by what you do, but rather who you are. And yet we really struggle to try to answer the question, who am I? There's a narrative that we've lived in preschool, kindergarten, and early formation years. A question was asked of us, what do you want to be when you grow up? And with smiles and dreams, we picked honorable jobs. I want to be a firefighter, a nurse, an astronaut. But as we move forward in life, practicality sets in. 
and those dreams and visions evaporate away. They are replaced with practicality and the question that's daunting, what am I going to be? Again, we are focused on the what, but let's start looking at who you are. Only by knowing who you are, are you able to go down the pathway of what you are going to do. So how do you figure out who you are? There's an exercise I call the five core elements. What are the five things in your life that you are not willing to compromise? This will become your life and your career, not just your career. The five things become your solid foundation. It's an aspect that if you want to build a house, you need a solid foundation. To build a life, you need a solid foundation. So how do you come up with these five core elements? Start asking yourself through reflection and introspection, what is it that you enjoy and don't enjoy? The critical piece is to ask why. What courses have you done? What did you enjoy about them or didn't enjoy? Why? What about previous jobs or the current job? What do you do? What do you enjoy and don't enjoy? Why? What do you like to do in your spare time? Why? This will help you to start exploring words because you'll start seeing a pattern. And once you gather these, don't be afraid because you'll be able to change these words as you grow in life. But you need to have a point to start from, something to balance any opportunities that emerge. That becomes your foundation and an opportunity for you to start looking at who you are and being able to express it in a statement and start owning the statement. These five elements will help you realize that rather than the noise around you telling you what to do, you're going to have the voice within activated that's going to actually be louder than the noise around. Oops. All right, let me just bring this here. <clears throat> I hope that that was helpful with regards to a, a, a very brief presentation that I created, and there's about four of them that I've got. This one is about the five core elements and who you are. In order to go through a mentorship relationship and really make the most, I always say, what are the five things that make up your foundation? So for me, these five things are servant leadership, story sharing, activator and igniter, champion and enabler, and community do-gooder. Those are five things I'm not willing to compromise. And you can start this at any time in your life because any opportunity that emerges has to hit those five core elements. So as mentioned in that little video clip I did for you, you know, look at things like what core, uh, you know, if you have a job, what do you like about it or don't like about it? What classes did you enjoy? Didn't enjoy? What do you do in your social time? And what do you think about? But always asking yourself why? And it's helpful to start this even at the point where you are in life, because this will change. Your words will change as you grow in life and career. So don't be worried about, is this the right word or is it not the right word? You just need to have that foundation because it's going to help you and offer you clarity as you move forward. There's also this 16 personalities test. I make my students do this. It's a free test and it gives you four letters. And out of those four letters, you plug it into Google. It'll tell you what some of your strengths and weaknesses are. Maybe some of your five core elements are in that four letters, uh, strengths and weaknesses. I also make my students write a personal statement. A personal statement is a, a paragraph telling me as an introduction who you are. 
And my students say it's a difficult thing to do because normally what we would do is write it in resume format. I am this, I am that, I am this. A personal statement instead is something that's more deeper and richer. So for example, instead of saying, you know, I teach at university, I'm a, so I'm a lecturer, uh, I'm an author, blogger and all that. If I meet somebody for the first time and someone says, tell me about Sam. So for example, I do a lot of podcasts as, as, as a guest. And oftentimes the first question they ask me is, who is Sam? And then I always say, let me describe it with five key things that I'm not willing to compromise. Servant leadership, story sharing, activator igniter, champion enabler, and community do-gooder. Those five core elements have enabled me to help individuals, teams, organizations, and nonprofits to the best of their capacities and abilities. And as a result of these five core elements, it's made me into a speaker storyteller, a mentor and a coach, and then I go on and on. That's a, it's a much more profound statement. So connecting things together is by knowing who you are, it's going to help you build your confidence as you move forward into post-secondary education, because you're gonna have a, a, a firmer foundation to start from. Mentorship and coaching is going to be important for you. And I always say to myself, okay, are you ready to mentor? And people who are graduating from high school would be like, of course not. I mean, I'm just looking for this opportunity to learn about the future steps. I said, no, no. If somebody who's younger than you from primary school is entering into secondary school, would you be able to guide them on how to succeed? And they're like, of course. And I said, great, you're ready to mentor. Know that where you are in life, you have already gained some experiences. Now, mentorship and coaching also means that you need to get support as well. I always say that, you know, I define it as mentorship and coaching. If somebody has a conversation with me and they are really lost, they're not, and I have a lot of those conversations, they're not sure the journey or the pathway. I go into coaching mode. This is where I ask a lot of questions, you know, to see what really resonates and what matters. Mentoring is once they have an idea of the direction they need to go, then it's more of introducing them to people, experiences, and we, we look at the direction they're gonna go. So mentorship and coaching are interchangeable depending on the person. But as an individual, know that, you know, you may not have answers at this point, and that's okay. But the five, five core elements and foundation, the personal statement, the 16 personalities test is going to start providing you this foundation. Because once you have a better idea of who you are, the mentoring coaching relationship starts to progress in a much more promising way. So why is mentorship and coaching important? The reason being is it's important because, you know, you're not in this by yourself. And a mentor and a coach, especially good ones, are not here to tell you what to do. They're here to listen to who you are as an individual. But what's also really important is, um, um, since I've had all these conversations, about 5,000 conversations, I learned from my mentees as well. And people are like, yeah, but Sam, I'm a high school student. What, what, have, what can I possibly be giving you? I said, I'm not that great with technology. I'm not that great with social media, for example. I mean, I'm on social media and, and I've got someone who's building a website for me, but that's the importance of it. You have something valuable to contribute. So never think of yourself as, okay, I'm only here to accept information. So it's always important, know who you are, but also get to know your mentor. So you make the most of that relationship. And also there may be a time when you are assigned a mentor who has nothing to do with your area. So for example, I don't have anything to do with finance and yet mentorship programs will assign somebody to me uh, who's a finance student. And they're like, oh, you gave me Sam and all of a sudden 
they're like, could I change? And they're like, no, no. The organizers are like, trust me on this. Some of the best mentors are not in your area. So instead of trying to change a mentor, go with the one that they're assigning you. But here's the thing. You're also not assigned uh, one mentor only. You can have multiple mentors. So if you are interested in a particular area of study, you can still have a, a mentor in that area and you can have a mentor who's your career guide. So don't worry about uh, only limiting yourself to one mentor. I also say the important piece about uh, mentorship is do it as relationship building over networking. People use the word networking all too easily. And they say, oh, we're going to a networking event. I'm always saying, instead of networking, think of it as relationship building. In other words, after the mentorship relationship is over, because usually there's a specified term, maybe a year, I, I'm still connected to people I mentored and coached 15, 16, 17 years ago. And they're still coming to me for insights or information. Also, there's a valuable tool to look into. Maybe, you know, you could start it now, but LinkedIn is a really great tool. LinkedIn is a professional area where you can learn about careers. You can learn about people. You can actually reach out and connect with these people. I'm on LinkedIn. And if you find me, you can always send me a request. And here's the trick. With LinkedIn, the generic message is, hi, Sam, can we connect? And I get anywhere from one to five per day. But it also enables you to send a personal message. And if you send a personal message, the likelihood of somebody connecting with you has now increased exponentially. But LinkedIn is a way for you to learn about universities, colleges, uh, professors, employers, individuals, any number of places. And there's no limitation with regards to where people are. So don't limit yourself just to the Middle East region. Expand it and send a notification and see what happens. Somebody may actually connect with you. And my commitment is if you are in this session, you can always reach out, send a personal note and say that you were in the session. And of course, I will connect with you. I'm gonna share with you some life lessons for the last 15 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. Storytelling. My first TEDx speech I did was on personal storytelling and it's called discovering the extraordinary in the ordinary. In other words, we live in the ordinary but embedded in the ordinary are these tremendously extraordinary experiences. So how does one go about discovering the extraordinary in the ordinary and building stories is through this thing called carpe. So carpe is this concept that I came up with, which is curiosity, appreciation, reflection, perspectives, and experience. Go through life in a curious nature, so have curiosity. Appreciation is appreciating things, uh, situations, and people for more than what they are. And reflection, deeper meaning. By reflecting, it adds purpose and significance. Perspectives, we all have perspectives. They've established over time. And those perspectives help us to add more richness to our stories. But the last one is very important, experience. If you don't capture the story and catalog it as a story, your story will die an untimely death. We're all living stories. We all have this ability to share stories, and it's a powerful tool. I want you to know that obstacles are the necessary bricks on your road to success. We all have obstacles that emerge, but instead of fearing obstacles, embrace them. What I mean by this is, as you move forward, obstacles are there as learning, uh, learning tools. But people fear them because they're always worried about what happens if this happens, what happens here? And I've had my setbacks, but obstacles, you get back up again, dust yourself off, but it's the key thing is what do I learn? And it makes you stronger. So don't fear the obstacles, instead embrace them and learn from them. 
it's also about transaction and transformation. It's very easy and we go through life with a transactional mindset. I mean, if you've ever been to uh, a Starbucks or a grocery store, when we walk in, we may say, hi, hi. And the person says, hi back. And it's like, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. What would you like? That's a transaction. Transformation is far more deeper and richer. And this is a way that helps to build those relationships. So transformation, I'll give you an example. Uh, I went to with 20 of my students to Toronto for an event. And after the event, we went for dinner. Well, fast food restaurant, we went into a place called Chipotle's. And when I walked in, you know, the person behind the counter said, what would you like? And she pointed to the menu and everything in front of her. And I said, wait, so how long have you been here? And she said, oh, about three years. I said, okay, make me what you would eat here. And she looked at me and she goes, are you sure? And I said, yeah, make me what you would eat. That's what I want. And, you know, a smile happened on her face. And she took the burrito shell and she said, would you like black beans or brown beans? I said, what would you use? And she said, well, black beans. I said, put black beans and don't ask me again. And with a smile, I wasn't being mean. And she smiled back and she said, okay. Next thing you know, she just kept piling so much food into this thing. And she was laughing, her manager's laughing, the cashier's laughing. They were all having a really good time. My students are all laughing. And at the end, she made me such a huge, big burrito that couldn't even be closed. But at the end, she also said, man, that was fun. Thank you for today. That's transformation. It doesn't have to be epic. It can be small. I also had a student in my FIC class. At the end of every lecture, two things happen. Students either rush for the door or they come up and ask questions. But Lisa, one of my students, quietly would pack her stuff. She'd walk to the door and stay there until I was answering questions, I'd look to the door and Lisa was there. And then she'd suddenly say, thank you for today. I appreciate that. And every time, every at the end of every lecture, that's what she would say. Well, it meant a lot to me. And I told her that on the last lecture. And she's in Korea now, and we're still in touch just because of that transformation. Purpose over passion. Society will say, find your passion and it'll ignite your, you know, uh, it's what you need. My thing is passion is an igniter. Passion cannot be sustained. Really what it should guide you to is your purpose. But as you're starting out, it's gonna be very difficult to find your purpose. But take your time, but have this inside of the back of your mind to say passion is an igniter, purpose is my flame. And how do I get the igniter to light that flame. And people like me who will mentor and coach you are there to support that. Goals versus intentions. I've got 12 projects I'm working on right now and all 12 layer in and support the other projects, but I don't have goals. And people look at me going, oh my gosh, you're aimless. And I said, no, no, I'm very specific. See, goals are very linear. Goals are very absolute. Someone's asking you, what's your one-year goal? Where are you going to go? Instead of a goal, I have intentions. I'm guided by those five things I shared with you earlier. Those five things resonate and tell me what I should be doing in the future. So for example, when writing emerged my pathway, writing was never a goal of mine. And I would have had to give that up in order to pursue my goals. Instead, I looked at writing and said, actually, it hits five out of five. I need to do this. So it's not to say if you have goals, you're wrong. I'm just saying many of us live in the world of intentions. While we may not even be aware of it, but we live in the world of intentions. Problem and solutions. The world is full of problems. And everybody can tell you what the problem is. But what's the solution? I need you to start taking your tools that you are going to establish either through high school and post-secondary, they're gonna give you tools to solve problems, but don't rest on the problem and just sit there and complain. Don't be a bystander in life. I need you to work towards solutions. 
I've got two or three more stories and then we'll be ending the session today. And then I'll open it up to questions. Winning the lottery, but losing the ticket. Now, I'm not talking about the lottery tickets that you buy to earn money, like uh, huge prizes. I'm talking about the lottery tickets in your life. Do you realize there are many lottery tickets that you receive? And they're winning lottery tickets. What I mean by that is people you meet who have insight and are there to uh, offer you their guidance. That's winning the lottery. They're here to help you. But so many times people lose the ticket. What I mean is there are times where I've met someone and I'm honestly really trying to help them. And I give them my card and I say, you know, contact me and I, I can help you. And they're like, oh, thank you so much. They just won the lottery. People I've just met who are looking for a job. And I say, well, I know people in this industry. Here's my card. So they win the lottery. They lost the ticket. I never hear back from them. Recently, I went to a restaurant to pick up our food during COVID. And I was talking to the cashier and she was saying how she's graduating university. And we talked to and I said, oh, I work at uh, both FIC and SFU. And uh, she said, oh, that's great. And I said, but I mentor and I coach young people to help them find their pathway. And she goes, oh, I need that. I said, okay, I'll tell you what, here's my contact information and my website, contact me. And you know, we can sit down and have a cup of tea together and uh, let me hear what's going on. She won the lottery, but you know what? Never heard back from her, lost the ticket. Maybe she lost my contact information or whatnot. When somebody is offering that support, take advantage of it. Send them an email at least and say, thank you for today. I appreciated the opportunity. I'm gonna share the teacup story. Oftentimes we try to do the big impact to impress people. It's the little things that are going to impress people. Go for the big ones, but equally don't ignore the small things. I had a group of students go to Washington State and for a competition and there were students from around the world. And they got to the offices of JP Morgan, which is a, one of the largest financial institution to meet some senior executives. Well, what was interesting is, you know, everybody was, there was about a hundred people there. They all talked, uh, shared. And then at the end, everybody got up, said their thank yous and left. My coach came back to thank some of the people. And he saw the senior most person at JP Morgan in that big room. And they started talking. But what he also noticed is that senior most person was also picking up teacups while they're talking and putting it on the sideboard. The coach said, you know, you must be really busy. And he said, no, I'm extremely busy. But he said, but there are people here to clean up. And he goes, yes, I would never leave these cups at home on a table for someone to clean up after me. Why would I let someone else do this for me? But it was more important what he said next. He said, I had a room of bright, intelligent, articulate individuals. I could hire any one of them. But if one of them today would have picked up their cup and saucer and moved it to the sideboard because that's what they think is the right thing to do, that's the student I wanna to talk to. Now, this doesn't mean that as you listen to this story, you suddenly are at an event, you grab your cup and saucer and you walk it to the sideboard saying, look, I'm taking my cup and saucer over to the sideboard. I hope people are watching. I'm, I need a coach, I need a mentor, I need a job. It's just quietly doing what is important. People are watching. I'm also gonna share this piece about connectedness. There's two parts. We're trying to solve our life puzzle, but here's the thing. Your life puzzle is very complicated and you can't solve your life puzzle and it gets frustrating. So what people, if I came and dropped a 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle on your table, but I left with the cover, what are you building? You have no idea. And it's frustrating. The puzzle box cover is your completed life, but I've taken that away and the puzzle is your life. What people want to do is take the puzzle, throw it up in the air, and when it crashes, they hope that everything bounces into place and their life is before them. But you know what? Puzzles in life don't work that way. You're going to have to build the puzzle piece by piece, section by section. So you've got 5,000 pieces and you start sifting through it. Maybe you find a piece of a chimney door or window and you're like, I think there's a house here. So you pull the pieces. 
and you start building a house. But halfway through building the house, you turn a piece over and you find a part of a ship. And you're like, oh, wait, that's part of a ship. And then you start finding more parts of a ship. The house isn't done. Now you're building a ship. And then finally, you find pieces of a car. So your life is in segments and sections, but none of it is connected. And it doesn't make sense. But instead of trying to connect everything and try to make sense of your life puzzle, what I want you to do is start to look for this, those single pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. If you've ever built a puzzle, sometimes you find that one piece that connects the sections together. This one piece could be a mentor, could be an opportunity, could be any number of things. But this is what I need you to find is that single piece that's going to make sense it helped you to make more sense. The other part about connectedness I want to share is I've given about 5000 pieces of a jigsaw puzzle to date to people. This is what if you were to look at one piece and I give you one piece and I hope that if you come to FIC and as if you I will meet you and I can give you a piece of a jigsaw puzzle, but this is if I give you a piece of a puzzle. It's ordinary. There's not much you can do with one piece. This is what people feel like. They feel like that single piece of a jigsaw puzzle. They don't know where they fit in and what's the bigger picture. But I'm going to make this extraordinary and I'm going to transform it right before your eyes. Instead of the single piece, I want you to think of this satchel, the source of the puzzle. Because if I give you a piece of my puzzle, do you realize my puzzle will never be, it will never be complete without you? Do you realize how important you are to the puzzle to the puzzle I'm making in life? It's a reminder that you are important. So I'm going to be ending on this note. This is my signature tagline. It's a it's a tagline that I want everyone to sort of really resonate with. Everyone's life is an autobiography. Make yours worth reading. You are a living autobiography. And oftentimes we may feel just average and who wants is interested in my story. No, no, everybody has richness in their life and their story, but we just need to be more reflective and we need to be capturing more of those moments. I want to take the opportunity to say thank you for today and the ability to share. I do hope that I have an opportunity to see you here in Vancouver and Know that I've, if I'm here and, and you come to FIC SFU, my door will always be open to you, even after the fact. I always say that I'm accessible and available, even if you just want to sit down and have a cup of tea. I'm actually going to be meeting my students, uh, one of them on Wednesday tomorrow, and a couple of a number of them actually have offered it to my class to get together for a cup of tea. So I hope that we get that chance. So here's my contact information. You can always take a picture of this screen, uh, but this is who I am as an individual. Uh, there's my email address at SFU, uh, my website, Instagram, Twitter, and on LinkedIn. So I do hope that I get a chance to get to know you better. So I'm gonna end it there. I'm gonna hand it back to the organizers. And then what I'll do is I'm gonna stop my screen share and there you go. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I had a question uh, that a student asked me on the side, asking what uh, you think of the law of attraction and mm -hmm. what uh, way do you think is the best way to use it? Yeah, law of attraction, I think is, is interesting because I think sometimes, again, we try to guide it, or sorry, we think it's gonna come to us. I really think the more you understand and know yourself, the more clear the law of attraction becomes and opportunities emerge to you because you have made yourself open to it. So I think that's a, a really the way that I look at it. I think there's, I think there's work to be done on our own selves and that will help guide us to, and the attractions will come to us. I appreciate all of the uh, notes here. Uh, about the thank yous and things. And uh, Nadine, so I hope you got my email address, uh, but I appreciate that. Are there any other questions people have? I'll just put my email address in here again, just to be on the safe side. There you go, there's my email address. 
Any other questions that we've got? Uh, so Nadine is saying, I seem to be very good in many things, yet I don't seem to have a certain dream. What would you recommend for finding your dream? Yeah, uh, what I would say is your dream will become a reality. But at this time, don't don't be so focused on the final destination. In fact, um, I always say the final destination is it's it's there. And this is what people strive toward. Nadine, it's the journey. That's the most important part. And the more that you do and realize who you are as an individual, the more that destination becomes clear. So um, I always tell my students, don't be in a rush to try to find what that dream is uh, because it's gonna change as you do courses, as you have experiences and as you talk to people. But as I mentioned in that video that I shared with you, I think uh, unfortunately there's a lot of noise around us. Uh, the first TEDx speech, or sorry, the second TEDx speech was about activating that voice within to be louder than the noise around. And the importance of that is the noise is telling you the direction to go. And sometimes we go down that pathway, like we're on a train and we're going to that destination. But only when you get to know yourself, do you realize, are, am I even on the right train? And Nadine, you bring up a really good point though, which I, I also want to share, because I have conversations with many people who say, Oh, Sam, I just wasted two years of my life. I was in engineering, but you know what? That's not what I want to do anymore. And I said, okay, so you're calling it a waste of time. And they're like, yeah, two years of my life. I'm not going to be doing this. And I said, okay, so when you were in engineering, you shut it out, you learn nothing. And they're like, no, no, I, I did learn. And I said, well, it's not a waste of time. You're going to have a way of thinking that's actually going to help you in life. So to Nadine and anyone else listening out there, I'd say focus on understanding and realizing yourself and slowly that pathway will start to materialize and don't be afraid to change like, but don't keep changing like uh, ice cream flavors and go chocolate one day, vanilla another day and green tea ice cream another day and say, okay, mango tomorrow. Okay, that's also a challenge as well. But the more that you're like, oh man, I actually really like mango ice cream and start learning about who you are as an individual. And that's where the mentorship and coaching is beneficial because there are people there. And a mentor and a coach is not someone who's there to tell you what to do. A mentor and a coach is there to, to say, okay, what's important to you? How do we get you where you want to go? And you can always change the journey while you're on it. And I'm always having these conversations. Uh, Reem, I see your note. Uh, how can I expand my connections other than LinkedIn and social media platforms? Uh, I think, Reem, the way that I would uh, articulate this is to say um, it's about treating everyone, and I'm sure you do this already, with respect. Because what happens is that personal brand that you build is going to carry you forward. People will know who Reem is. Maybe they're learning about Reem right now. Actually, Reem may be learning about who she is as well. But equally at the same time, uh, that brand becomes really important and those people come to you now. So uh, put a lot of emphasis on being the best version of, of yourself. Uh, I see a note from Salma. I'm in political science uh, department. Uh, okay, give you advice. Well, actually Salma, uh, I, my business and political science. So I have a, I, I can relate to the political science piece as well. Uh, you know, it's all about, and number one, I will never give advice. I will ask you a bunch of questions, but never give you advice. There's enough people telling you what to do. Um, but political science, anything that you decide to do is always going to open doors. I had a conversation with the senior strategist at a, at a bank here in Vancouver. Well, their undergraduate degree was in history. So again, the more understanding you have of yourself, it doesn't mean that if you're in business, then the world is suddenly opened up and, and they come running to you. Employers are asking who you are and what can you do? Perfect. So I hope, uh, so let's see, anyone else? Um, I, yes, okay. I oh, two students yeah. Two questions on the side. 
So Ola is saying, I'm studying medicine now, but my dream was to be an astronaut. Should I switch? By the way, I like medicine too. Okay. Well, actually, I'm, again, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Um, you know, I mean, I'm very impressed that you have these two noble areas of medicine as well as being an astronaut. And think of it this way, regardless of the pathway that you pick, it sounds like you're going to be helping society and humanity in one way or another. And I think that's the important part to realize. And never think of it as what am I giving up? Because really, when we make that decision, we always sit in a point of what did I just give up? And we, and we wallow in what I gave up. But we forget, but what am I gaining here? So, you know, and to be a, a doctor doesn't mean you can't be an astronaut. There are astronauts who are doctors as well. So somewhere along the way, maybe 20 years from now, maybe both will merge together where 20 years from now, maybe we have a colony on the moon and they need doctors there <clears throat> and they need astronauts. And by being an astronaut and a doctor, it'll get you to that point. Also look beyond today, focus on the future as well. So I hope that helps. And is there another question? <clears throat> uh, yes, Dr. Sam, actually there are three more. Okay. Um, so Nuran is saying, um, as a mentor, is it part of your job to help with time management and one being disciplined to self-improvement where there's no other external obligation but yourself? Right. Well, um, as a mentor, I think that it's a very organic term. In other words, uh, there's not a structure. Like if you get me as your mentor, I'm very organic. What I mean by organic is if you and I sit down for the first time, I'm, I'm going to say, what would you like to talk about today? And then we guide our conversation and direction. <clears throat> if time management is something you really need support and help on, then you ask your mentor, you know, this is an area that I may struggle on. What are some recommendations that you have on how, how do you keep organized? So think of it as the mentor is there to provide insight and support. And if somebody asks me a question and I'm not too clear about, or I may not be the what I call expert, I put them in touch with somebody else. Like for example, prime example, I have a student who just got into Simon Fraser University on a full ride scholarship and she's really nervous. Uh, she's not sure what courses to select. Now I work, in, I teach classes, but I'm not in the administration or the academic side of things of the course selections. I actually reached out to my, one of my best students right now I said, I need your help here. Can you talk to her, remove some of that anxiety and make sure she's picked the right courses. So if I'm not the expert, I'm surrounded by experts. So if it's time management, ask your mentor. And if they're not comfortable with it, then maybe they could help you find the right people that uh, know how to do time management. Okay, another one. Uh, Sarah saying, I'm studying agriculture engineering and I'm willing to study to digital marketing and communication like a second major, but I'm feeling a little bit afraid from failing. How can I turn off this feeling? Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, again, I think the, the groundwork you do by understanding yourself and venture out. Um, I think you bring up a really good point that I, I'm glad you brought up. This word of failure. I think society uses this word all too often. I actually don't like the word failure. Failure is fatal and failure is final. Now, I have never had a failure in my life, but I've had setbacks. It's the exact same incident, but it's how do you frame it? Because a failure is, that's it. And you walk, wipe your hands, walk away and say, that was it. And I learned nothing from it. A setback, though, is where you <clears throat> something happens and it didn't work. You get back up again, dust yourself off, learn from the experience, and you emerge even stronger because of that. And that's where I shared the obstacles are the necessary bricks on your road to success. Uh, so don't fear those things. I mean, you, you want to make sure that you're prepared for it. But as you become more clear on who you are, 
all of a sudden things start to materialize and it gives you a better, firmer understanding. Is this the right pathway or is it not the right pathway? And why is it the right pathway or not the right pathway? Hopefully that helps. Uh, last question uh, from Nuran. She's saying, I'm a high school student and I just want to know how to manage stress. Okay. Um, you know, Nuran, it, it, you know, stress is all part of life. And there's, when I talk about stress and stress management in my class, because I teach organizational behavior, um, stress is actually good because stress at a certain point is raising that awareness piece, the excitement. Uh, for example, when I did my TEDx speeches, there was that level of stress I needed to engage and, and ex uh, excite me about what I was about to undertake. It's like going on an amusement ride. I mean, you're like, okay, this is going to be scary, but uh, it's going to be fun too. I would say a few things on that point about managing stress is, number one, what is it that's stressing you out? Is it the unknown? Is it the workload? Um, you know, the people... So understand to dissect it first to say, but what's stressing me? The second part is understanding the mechanisms. In other words, anytime I see, I thrive uh, in ambiguity and uncertainty. And people think I'm crazy because I actually go into the zones of the unknown of how things are going to turn out. But what I do is I don't go in blindly. I, I look at it and I say, okay, what's the worst case scenario here? What's the, uh, where are my feet going to land? And I do this with people as well when they say, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed and this and this and that. And uh, I always say, okay, what's the worst case scenario here? Does anybody die or get hurt? And they're like, no. And I said, great. So we know that the worst is not going to be there. But where's the, where's the fear factor here? The, the part that you're uncomfortable with? And how do we suddenly um, reduce it? You can't remove it, but you can reduce it. And part of it is better prepare uh, preparation on yourself so that you can understand, you know, the bigger picture of, of outcomes and things. But also, don't be afraid to seek out resources or talk to people. Uh, don't internalize it um, yourself. There are, again, people like me who are here to uh, help you uh, resolve that stress issue and offer some more clarity. So I hope that that's helped. Actually, we have two last questions. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm, I'm able to do that. So Muhammad's asking, how can I be superior in my dreams? Oh, sorry, I, I lost that. How can you? He's asking, how can I be superior in my dream? Oh, be superior in your dream. Again, lay your foundation down. Who are you? Because that's going to provide you this solid foundation to move forward on. And it's about the dream is some visionary piece down the road, but what you need to do is what are the laying of the foundation stones to get you across? So in other words, think of it as, and this is where I use a lot of analogies and stories is think of it as your dream is across this river. It's a shallow river, but it's enough that it's still a bit of a challenge and you're on one side of the bank. Well, the first thing we do is we pick up a stone and drop it in front of us, just high enough that I'm able to stand on that stone. And then what do you do? You see that you're just a little bit closer to that bank, but still far away. Pick up another st uh, stones and start dropping them in front of you. And slowly you're on the other bank and then you've reached your dreams. But the idea is it's going to take time. Start visioning where and how you're going to go forward and who you are as an individual because it starts to make sense but again don't rush it because your dream may change and it's okay if it changes mine's changed i left a corporate job everything was safe and secure and i left it because it wasn't me anymore so don't be afraid to um shift and change but equally the more work you do on who understanding who you are through reflection and perspectives about who you are it's going to help you realize that dream and i also see a note from uh Rizane, which is what if i what should i do if i chose the wrong major i feel interested in my course and i'm graduating next year um so again you didn't well the you the wrong major isn't necessarily the wrong major. It just isn't what really resonates. 
Uh, what I would share on that is what I've always said is, if let's say everybody goes into a store to buy a suit and the only suit that's available, there's a lot of these suits, but they're all the wrong size, 52 short. And I'm a 42 regular, but 52 short. I can wear the suit, but it doesn't fit me. And that goes to your point about what if I choose the wrong major? You're not interested in the course and you're graduating next year. Well, what do I do? That's a choice that'll be up to you. And I always try to help people come up with a tailored solution, a tailored suit here. And I say, where you are, maybe you feel it's the wrong major. Is there a way that you can take the major and blend it to something that's more interesting? Or if you're uninterested in the courses you're doing and you're graduating next year, somewhere you'll have to make a decision. Do I stay? in that major, or do I change? And I've, I've talked to my students about this. Uh, I've had students who were in accounting and they're literally not even a year away from graduating. They were literally weeks away from graduating. And they decided to switch to marketing. And again, they said, I made the biggest mistake in my life. I went in accounting. After I saw accounting, what it is and the people, and it wasn't that she didn't like them. She just said it wasn't me, but marketing is what she wanted. And it meant she stayed an extra year, but the, the accounting helped her on, uh, with regards to the marketing aspect in certain regards. So again, Rosane, I would say, uh, what should you do if you choose the wrong major? Number one, is it really the wrong major? But again, through reflection and introspection, what is it that you find uninteresting about the courses? And what would you find interesting? And can you blend them together? I hope that that helps. So last question is, um, how do I really know what I like in the long run? What are the steps I should follow to understand my passion better? Cool. Uh, so I would say if, as I spoke about the five core elements, I, I suggested it briefly. Uh, if you Google my name and uh, sorry, if you take, go to YouTube and type my name in, you'll see my TEDx speech where I go into more detail or go to my website. And there's a blog post that I wrote about finding the five core elements, because I really think the foundational piece is understanding and realizing who you are, that foundational piece, because I have students that have graduated five, 10 years in industry. I even have senior executives who still don't know who they are, but they're still doing what they do. And then after we have this conversation, they suddenly realize I was never even on the right train, my career, I should have gone on this train. So the more you can do right now, the more helpful it will be. So maybe go find that uh, TEDx speech I did, as well as, you know, the blog posts I've written, that may offer some support and guidance. And if you any of you come to SFU, please reach out to me, um, uh, you know, at FIC and SFU, and then tell me that you met me here. And um, we can always sit down and have a much more deeper conversation. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sam. And thank you students for attending with us today's session. Um, here is our email, our website, and our Instagram, if you ever need anything. And as I said, our, our webinars are recorded and will be uploaded on our website soon. Uh, this is the second session, part of the summer boot camp in collaboration with our partner, Navitas. And tomorrow we're going to be having a very interesting topic about positive psychology with ICM. So I hope to, all, to see you all there. And as I said earlier uh, as well, that we are all going to be getting a certificate of attendance uh, for each university that you attend the webinar with. Uh, Dr. Sam, I really appreciate your very lovely and heartwarming presentation. It was very informative, very nice, very lively. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. And to the students that are listening, I mean, Thank you for being here today and I wish you all the best on your journey wherever you go in life, but I do hope that we get to have a chance to sit down and have a cup of tea together and uh, talk about life and career. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Thank you. Um, all right. Okay.
So this is going to be the end of the session. I hope you guys have a lovely day, evening, night, or wherever you are. Um, goodbye. All right. All the best, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.